Attention, Austin guitar players and bass players. Are you in need of setup or repair on your axe? Well, I have the guy for you, gang. That's Jason Swedberg over at J. Scott Luthery, and you can find him at J. Scott Luthery on Instagram. Now, if you listen to the show, you know I've been talking about Jason for years. Why is that? Because I've been taking my guitars to Jason for over 20 years. Not only does he do the best job, but he has the best prices and the fastest service in town. Again, find him at J. Scott Luthery on Instagram. Not only is he doing an amazing job repairing and setting up guitars, he is now building guitars. That's right. He built me an SG Junior, which I have, and it sounds amazing. It feels great. It's, it's the very first SG Junior he ever built. I've got a J. Scott Luthery SG Junior. You can go see him at uh, J. Scott Luthery on Instagram. Get a guitar built. Get your guitars fixed. Get them set up. It's time, man. They've been hanging on the wall all through COVID. Now it's time to get them out, get them fixed, and get out there and play. J. Scott Luthery on Instagram. Let's get down. Hey, gang. It's Johnny. I just want to take a second to talk to you guys about engagement. Right now, you're listening to the show, and I'm not sure exactly what platform you're listening to it on. But whatever platform you're listening to it on, you, you can subscribe to it and get an alert every time a new show drops, usually every Tuesday and every Friday. New shows every Tuesday and every Friday. Whatever platform you're listening on, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Overcast, Stitcher, any platform, you can subscribe to it. And if you can leave a comment, leave a star, share it on your social media if it's something that you like, Please do that. We encourage you to do that. And also, as far as social media goes, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I am at Johnny Gowdy on Instagram and Twitter. Give us a follow. Also, you can like our Facebook page. How did I get here? Please do. Anyway, all I want to say is you like a show, share it. Use the hashtag. How did I get here? Pod. We'll give you a shout out. Thank you so much for listening to the show and engage. Open my vault? Open your vault. Once I open the vault, it ceases to be a vault. You have no choice. Wait, the vault. Hello, I'm Johnny. I'm your host and welcome to another episode of How Did I Get Here from the Vault, where we reach back into our vault of well over a thousand episodes, pull one out, shine it up and re-release it for you just in case you missed it or just in case you want to hear it again. Today, we go back to episode 851 from October of 2019 with the great Quint Kenny Withrow, guitar player from Edie Burkell and New Bohemians. Great, great conversation out at Soundcheck, which is a fantastic rehearsal place here in Austin that's used by the stars. Uh, they have one in, in uh, Nashville as well. I'm sure they have them other places as well. Anyway, uh, back in October of 2019, Edie Burkell and New Bohemians were getting together and filming some stuff for social media and rehearsing and getting ready to do some shows and stuff. They were going to release their record, uh, Hunter and the Dog Star, in, in 2020, but that, that did not happen until February of 2021. Anyway, I got down there. My friend Kyle Crusham has been working with the band for the last few years, produced their last couple of records, Rocket, and as I said, Hunter and the Dog Star. He was also playing with them, but he hooked me up with Kenny, and uh, they invited me down there before stuff got going. So I went down there uh, in the morning, one October morning in 2019, sat down with the great Kenny Withrow, and talked about the uh, amazing and unusual ascension of Edie Bukel and New Bohemians. Like when their first record shooting ba rubber bands at the Stars came out, in 1988 and their single what i am hit the radio and went into the top 10 it was ubiquitous man everywhere you went that song was playing still is kind of you know what i mean i still hear it at the grocery store and stuff like that anyway great conversation about that his unique guitar style making the album rocket with my friend kyle crusham and uh and getting to play with bob weir and much much more i uh, i actually had a funny experience uh because i'm friends with a couple of the other guys in new bohemians i'm friends with john bush and i'm friends with uh with Brad Hauser, who have both been on the show. Maybe I should re-release those, too, as a From the Vault. Anyway, uh, when they showed up after the interview, we all started talking. <laughs> and then E. Rukel showed up. And I was sitting there on the couch kind of shooting the shit with the friends, eating, eating from their craft services, and just kind of like generally shooting the shit with my friends. And I was sitting there with, you know, maybe my feet were on the table. I don't even know. But after a little while, I realized that I, I, no one was introducing me to, to Edie Brickell. 
And so I had to do it. So I stood up and I said, uh, hi, Edie, I'm Johnny. And she said, oh, hi, it's really nice to meet you and thank you for everything you've been doing. So I think she thinks I was a production assistant or something. Now, nobody stopped her and said, oh, no, 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 that's Johnny. He's our friend. He interviewed Kenny. No, no one said that at all. It was just me standing there. And so I didn't know what to say. So I just said, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so as far as Edie Brickell knows, this interview never took place. And I brought some snacks or something and then just sat around like a lazy PA. <laughs> all right. This conversation with Kenny Withrow is fantastic. I hope you enjoy it. This is from episode 851, October 2019. This is me and Kenny Withrow, guitar player from Edie Brickell and New Bohemians. Let's get down. recently got to play with Bob Weir. Yeah, that I watched did. that on the internet. <laughs> that was interesting for so many different reasons. Well, we got to play Lockin Festival, which is the which is the best of the jam band festivals. So we were honored to get to be there and play right. for sure. And Bobby's funny, you know, he had just sat in with uh, Paul Simon at the Outside Lands Festival that we played the week before. Uh-huh. And uh, and he approached Paul as well, you know, he just is a guy who sits in with everybody and likes to play. He's just seems to be on a real trip about playing and all the time. Like maybe he's always been like that, probably. But anyway, he sat in with Paul and then, you know, he realized that we were sharing the same festival a couple of weeks later and he did extend an invitation, you know, would we like him to sit in? We're, absolutely, you know. So that was going to happen and uh, all of a sudden it was the day of the show and we, there was much debate on what song to do. I was kind of leaning towards Deep Ellum Blues because we are from Deep Ellum, right, you know. Right. Yeah. So I thought that was that was really cool. He was he had some other songs in in mind that we hadn't the band hadn't rehearsed lately and it was mainly the Bob Dylan tune Hard Rain Hard Rain's going to fall. Right. Uh, we haven't played that in, in many years, so we didn't necessarily pull that together. But anyway, he, so he came by our uh, trailer with his guitar, just completely instigated the entire thing, and even showed up for the rehearsal with his guitar. And so we just sat there and we're playing Deep Ellum Blues before I know it. And Edie was nice enough to grab the camera and take a picture Snap of some photo. videos of me playing, was jamming, that the, was jamming that, with Bobby. Mm-hmm. Was that the one with that stage that, that rotated? Yeah, that's the one. The stage rotates. It's it's what Woodstock was meant to do, but it never did do. It never did happen at Woodstock. I don't think the rotating stage happened. Yeah. So when you're playing facing forward, there's a band behind you setting up. Right. And so then, they did at Live Aid. They might have done that. It's a really smart way to do. It. I mean, it's the best way to do it because they literally and we didn't. Although we didn't do it very gracefully, you uh, you don't even have to stop <laughs> playing between bands. But, uh, you guys, I remember I watched the, that whole intro of it. Yeah. You were playing? I was playing. Yeah. Nobody could hear me. Nobody in the band could hear me. Oh. Uh, the plan was to start it because we like improvising. We were like, it's a jam festival. We're going to make up a song. In fact, we were trying to do that with Bobby as well. But they were, uh, it was the JG, G, Jerry Garcia band was doing Eyes of the World, a dead tune, which I know very well. And they were done. So the E is, the E chord is hanging out. And I'm like, cool. I'm going to go to the relative minor, basically the same chord, but a minor version. Right. And I'm going to start a jam. And everybody's just looking at me like, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, this is the jam. I've started. Let's play it. And everybody's just like, we can't hear you at all. So there was a little hiccup there, and we kind of meandered into it. and finally It seemed it. natural. That's, that's I'll tell awesome. you what. As someone watching it, I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. You're just kind of like, hey, here we are. I did, I, I, I did just uh, uh, abandon ship and start the first song. And we did Green Magic, the first song, which was, yeah. which was fun. Yeah. That's a great song. Um, I was noticing when I was, I was listening to Rocket, that was basically my preparation. And reading a very short interview with you, mm. that it was chock full of information, though, I'll tell you that. Oh, wow. Um, uh, I was listening to Rocket, and you're, you're really elegant, and you know when to step forward. You know when to hang back and keep the groove going and things like that. These sort of like, but it seems like you've always been like that. But on this record, I noticed that every guitar solo was different there was a characteristic where there was some sort of bombast in a couple of them mm-hmm. um 
Superheroes. Superhero. Yeah. yeah. What did you use on that? That's this. Uh, I call it a freak pedal. It's okay. is made by. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, the name of the actual company it doesn't come to mind right now, but it's it's sort of a Euro rack pedal that a lot of times keyboard players will use these pedals, and so you can send a sort of straight synth. Uh, uh, patch into it and you can just freak it out you know it, it does all sorts of, it generates all sorts of feedback and all sorts of loops and, and uh, circuits that go into one another it's a freaky pedal right. but it also has this ungodly distortion yeah you know so as Pretty a pedal it's spots. supposed to just go freak out on its own but I like dial all of that out as much as possible right, right. <laughs> and just use the insane distortion that's in it but what's funny about it is it sounds different every time I turn it on and you never know when those freaky sounds are actually going to be in your tone and it's just an X factor pedal is it like at analog oscillators or something like that right it's things like yeah. that that just blah, 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 yeah blah. they do their own thing they just do their own things like that but I, I temper it down there's a gate that I have it heavily gated so that's why it stops really yeah. abruptly in the middle of the solo a few times because I'm I'm getting all of that. <laughs> yeah. That's a serious tweaker pedal to make that happen on that solo. I really love that. Thanks very yeah. much. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, there was another thing I wanted to ask you about. Like, this band, you guys have been together over 30 years. Yeah, right? sure. With it, well, you know, yes. Yeah, with some breaks. Sure. Healthy breaks, probably. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, at this point, like so far, and you guys are... are I've just finished an album? We did, yeah. Okay. We just finished another one. And mm -hmm. so when you guys go in and write songs, first of all, it must be amazing because you're there with like your family. Mm -hmm. Like this is the original band. That's true. And, and you know, us getting back together, it, it was generated from exactly what you're talking about. We were getting, I was uh, teaching uh, after an after school program for uh, a free a program for kids after school teaching guitar. That's great. And it was a uh, public funded. Uh, uh, it was a public funded program at the time, so I was wanted to do a benefit. I was like, man, we should do a benefit for the school. It'll be great. It's a really these kids are wonderful, and so we were just doing that. Yeah. We hadn't played in a while, a couple years, but we get together and rehearsing we do rehearse but we just jam immediately we just start playing immediately that's just what we do that's you the know? nature of this that's how you became this band that's right? that is yeah. absolutely what we do all the time we just improvise you know to a fault sometimes you know we're not getting stuff done and things like that <laughs> if i was ever on tour and eat and i was in new york i was like Edie, we'd get together and we would just we just jam and write songs we have a ton of songs that Edie and i have just written the two of us sitting around just because we just do that all the time. So anyway, so we had done that, you know, we were supposed to be rehearsing and we were like four songs into it and it's like, well, you know, let's record these. And then all of a sudden there was a little body of songs and we were off to the races for sure. You know, we were just going to do the gig and, uh, and, and it was discovered that Kyle crush him. You know, I, I did some working with him because mm -hmm. Edie was finishing up a solo record of hers and uh, we got along great, and all these things came to elements came together, and yeah, we made Rocket. Yeah, yeah, that record's fantastic. Thank it really you. is, man. It's it's uh, it's weird in this time. Cause it must be weird for you guys because like you made a record, and it was you were like on top of the world from the get go. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, it's almost like working backwards in a way. Like you came out like like up there, like on Saturday Night Live, and like on the late shows and all that stuff yeah that's true well yeah that was really fast we were still playing in dallas we hadn't really even played out of texas we were played kids? austin a couple times yeah i was like 22 21 and uh did you say kids yeah we were kids yeah <laughs> yeah but we had played austin twice and maybe shreveport and hadn't toured you know we played in dallas hundreds and hundreds hundreds of times already we we played sometimes 15 times a week so we were definitely a schooled live band but uh, then, the, then the record came out, and you know, two weeks later, it was definite radio play. And a month and a half later, we're like they were invited to be on Saturday Night Live, and we hadn't even toured yet. So we literally played Saturday Night Live as the first gig of our first tour, and then went to Atlanta and started the tour proper. And that, well, that tour sold out. It was in smaller venues. It was just a freak, you know, freak show. <laughs> was there any kind of like? Did you then think like, well, this is how it works? Or, or did you? I mean, because that's a mind fuck, man. You're like a guy living in Dallas, playing with your friends, <laughs> and then you're on Saturday Night Live, and then you're like on a sold out tour. Well, you know, there was, the level of connection that was happening in Dallas with our 
crowd, with our people, with our crowd, with our community and us at the time was already a big red flag. There was something, we knew something was there, it, whether it would translate nationally or whatever. I don't know, but there was a connection going on there that I'd never seen before in my young, you, you just knew something special was happening Yeah, because, uh, you know, just it's hard to explain when a community no, and a group because Edie reflects what's going on in the environment around her in the community what I am was very much sort of uh, Whole Foods you go into Whole Foods at I that worked day. at Whole Foods at the time bro so if you go in, in Houston, with yeah. if you sniffle one time you got five people around you giving yeah. you all sorts of you know it was just <laughs> yeah, like it was, like, yeah. it was it was intense to go and you know so it was just sort of a back offish kind of eh cool it you know what I am you know so a lot of things were reflecting what was going on and just the level of engagement we just thought something you know we didn't know it was going to be what i am nobody knew it was going to be that song i mean when we played that was just another song that we played live there was no indication early on that that was going to be a thing all the songs were equally what they were so anyway yeah <laughs> that's just it's that's intense it's awesome that uh because i know brad and i i know john but i know them post the year 2000 so probably they're Whatever you know what I mean? They're sure. very down to earth and grounded people. I'm sure you were throughout that experience, but it must have been a little awkward on your own mind and just kind of like, who who am I? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I guess a little bit of that, but uh, it, it it was odd in that what what are we? What what is the band? Because it did change. Because Mainstream doesn't want dudes that walk on stage and and make up a song as their first song. That's not what the mainstream is out there doing. So it must have been odd coming from that. For sure. We were all of a sudden on Y95 in Dallas. (laughs) I'd never listened to Y95. (laughs) (laughs) I probably knew there was a Y95 before then, but I wasn't totally sure. So, yeah, it's you're thrust into a mainstream. But again, our shows were kind of like that. Families would come. Parents would bring their kids and just, you know, it was a weird across the board appeal you know that we were already kind of feeling and it was it was awesome that it translated and it was going to be what I am that was a surprise but yeah I'll, to to pull into some smaller towns and you know we were out selling madonna at the time and just like it was weird <laughs> for sure awesome cuz i mean you you know to go from madonna and then all of a sudden here's your song and then on to another song when you're listening to the radio yeah it's it's interesting yeah you know i feel lucky and i feel ha- i feel like we sort of uh snuck our way in and just yeah We'll it's see what we can do when, with it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting when someone that you view as like your kind of people breaks through and is like on that Y95 thing where you're like, wow, shit. <laughs> Those are like our kind of dudes. You know? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that is funny because I do remember that night seeing you guys at uh, at Zelda's and coming home and making something to eat and watching TV and the... Uh, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall video came on, and I was like, I just watched those dudes <laughs> while Mike, you know, was practically stripped on stage. <laughs> it was before he was getting totally naked, but... Um, yeah, that was, that was... And then I joined Billy Goat proper once the Nubos decided we were gonna not play How long were you in Billy Goat? After, that was the really early version of Billy Goat at when the first uh, Buki cassette came out. And then, uh, then we actually made a record called Bush Roaming Mammals, and I joined that band in 90... And that was Earl Harvin was the drummer, and that was a real heavier band. We had a real record, and we it was like industrial, tribal, lots of drums, and really heavy music. And we traveled around, and that was what I did right after Nubos. It seemed like the perfect opposite thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that scene of dudes. Like, were you close with all the Ten Hands guys and Sure Fever and the Funk House guys? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Because abs- abs- to me, Fever and the Funk House is kind of like to me your sister band up there. Do we, you they- know what I mean? They were, the, you know, and I don't think they would be bothered by me saying this because they told me it all the time. But they were the first band to come around. They're like, wow, we've influenced a band. You know, it was like yeah. a second generation. It was like, wow. I mean, it was like you guys, but more informed or, or also informed by the Stones. Very That's much what so. They seem like very much so. Yeah. Had the, and they and they certainly and and I'm talking early days. You know, just conga player. Ah, similar, some similar guitar. And I eventually gave Chris Clarity some. You know. I call him less whatever lessons. Yeah. He might call him lesson. I sat down and played with him, <laughs> but uh, and he's doing great by the way right now. And uh, but yeah, they had their own identity, and the Stones thing started coming in, and then they, you know, he was a storyteller, and they they yeah. quickly had their own trip happening and got really big. Yeah, in I Dallas. might have seen them. Uh, yeah, they used to come to Houston a lot. 
then. I was in a band that was managed by Fitzgeralds then. And so we had this great advantage where other, I can't remember what place uh, Ten Hands manager was affiliated with, but they did a lot of show trades. So we got to the, play Dada? with a lot of those bands and got to know a lot of those guys. Yeah, and play at Dada. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Raul was the manager guy? or, or I can't remember. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. It, was, it was at the time when, uh, when Joe had come in. Mm-hmm. And Mike had left. Okay. Whatever time that was. When he went on to Billy Goat. Or he, yeah. he was asked to leave when he poured a pitcher <laughs> of beer on <laughs> Paul's keyboard. Oh, so he did? Or poured is, is, is a little... It, it might have spilled. Yeah. Definite beer. And he was traversing from the rafters above the stage. I think he kicked a drink over on the, his keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. I how think was, that was the end of it. <laughs> how was it playing with Earl? Well, Earl's, you know... He's a powerhouse, for sure. He was back then, for sure. Earl's, he's a trip. He kind of, I mean, I mean, it was, it was a powerhouse. And, and my function in that band was feedback and get inside the groove and play hardcore rhythm. Because Philly Goat, the other guitar player, was he was about being Steve Vai over the top of this crazy stuff. So he he was the shredder. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I had to get in there and like get intense with the rhythm, which I really liked. Really digging in, you know, in, in the rhythm part of it, and then maybe making noise over the feedback over the drums. And yeah. it's like, all right, yeah, sign me up. I have to say, every time I saw Billy Goat, I was just always astounded, at like. Mike is so fucking weird and so cool with it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. I'd never seen anybody so free in my life. <laughs> Him and Kim together, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And yeah, I can't even really repeat stuff that would happen on stage. And you just kind of go, yeah, it's Kim and Mike. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but it was like, they would bring their personal life and all sorts of parts of their life onto the stage and just share it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't even know if he would remember me, but I, I consider him an acquaintance for sure that uh, he is like one of the people, grown men, that I've seen naked the most <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and that's just from going to see him play. It, that was always, that manifested in such funny ways. We were playing in Lawrence, Kansas one time and and it was like the third time they played there. I think the first time they kind of got in trouble with the cops, which always helps, you know. Yeah, that's cops awesome. know there's going to be naked people there, and so there's a big scene the next time. I was with them the third time they played, and everybody was there ready to get naked. It was the weirdest <laughs> it was the weirdest vibe showing up. And, like, you know, we played the first song. I don't know if we started with Everybody Take Your Clothes Off, which, you know, that was a big song. And Billy Goat. But we finished the first song, and I'm standing there. I look back, and there's, like... 15 people just standing naked at the back of the stage just sort of looking around I mean not not running around being crazy just standing there yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was just like the show yeah I just it was weird yeah, yeah. that was weird that was weird I mean they eventually you know started getting more natural but you don't want to 15 uncomfortable people just standing there naked yeah, yeah, <laughs> or maybe crazy. you do I don't know it depends on what you're into do you uh, do you still play with him Stay in uh, touch with Mike. I mean, I know he does a lot of different things. When he does gigs, I, I usually get the call to, oh, really? to do them. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. If I'm if I'm available, I I, I want to do them. They're fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's he What's he doing now? Well, Mike, you know, he does the Mike D band, and he plays with um, Ricky Lee Jones. Right. He tours with her. Him and Hubbard did that together, right? I think yeah, so. Yeah. And Mikey does it more often. I think he is. You know, when she tours, he's with her. Right. Right. And uh, I think he's playing with Les Claypool's, uh, oh, some, one awesome. of his solo bands as well. And then he's just Mike, you know, he's got uh, Nola Tet, I think is the name of his jazz quartet from New Orleans that travels. And Mike is the hardest working musician I know, no question. Yeah. Two, 250 to 300 gigs a year. Jesus. Yeah. In his van right now, I promise you. <laughs> you know, wow. he's just like that. You know, he's really impressive. He's he's really impressive and just keeps going. You know, he's making his own thing. Yeah. You know, it's jam, it's in the jam world, but he's a jazz player, and he, he's he's making his own industry. You know, that world of improvisational music does go hand in hand, right? And there's a you know, just like with everything, like there's good and there's bad stuff. Sure. Did you did you before you met these guys? Like, how did you how did guitar come to you? Uh, guitar came to me out of just being a quiet and shy, you know. I mean, literally, that's why it came to me early on and just like, this, oh, I could do this, I could express this way and, you know, youngest in the family, stuff like that. So guitar was a perfect outlet for a kid like me. And so uh, Jimmy Page, you know, 
Yeah. Stuff like that. He was my hero early on, absolutely, and I learned a lot of stuff. Jimmy Page, Ted Nugent, I don't care, I'll admit it. I loved Ted Nugent when yeah. I was a kid. Holy crap. And then uh, lots, lots of stuff, you know, just things like that. That's what brought me to guitar. And then uh, Rush and things like that. What really changed for me was getting to go to Booker T. Washington, getting to go to Arts Magnet. And then getting turned on, certainly getting turned on to jazz in school. Jazz, I didn't take to jazz like, wow, I need to learn this. Swing and things like that are, are great. I love listening to them, but it doesn't, I don't feel the need to learn that or play that except right. for the musical aspects of it. But what I really learned was from my friends. Everybody was listening to Devo, uh, Bo, you know, turned on to Bob Marley, Mahavishnu Orchestra. There's, you do have a reggae when you slide into that it's very 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 legit nice thanks yeah, yeah it's not like white dude <laughs> reggae <laughs> that's cool I know we both had to see a few times probably sure. at Dada there's plenty of that yeah <laughs> you know, um, and I don't know but yeah that's right you know Devo and, and Bob Marley and Mahavishnu Orchestra and just that's where I got turned on to all the music that I still listen to yeah mm. um, so what was like what kind of bands did you have like in high school? What kind of bands? Did you have any bands that? Well, uh, no, no big bands. No bands. Uh, there was a band called Fuquay, spelled like "fuck you." <laughs> Excuse me, is this a podcast? Can I <laughs> say that? Fine, fine. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, but it, it was Q U E, so Fu. Okay. Fuck you, Q Q U E. Anyway, but that was a high school band that we did and did some gigs and then that became a band called the knobs that was my high school band the doors the, the band was it's a long story anyway a band called the knobs which was with brad myself okay. and john bush and this drummer named big al big al emmer who's the drummer for a uh, brave combo okay. oh yeah yeah and the four of us we He's played the drummer for brave combo now mm -hmm. who was the old guy the older drummer no. well there was uh mitch marine was a yeah, really mitch. early guy yeah yeah, yeah wow you know mitch yeah, yeah you've yeah. been around okay yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's Dwight been, Yoakam for years, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I loved that band so much, man. Yeah, yeah, me too. Sorry, I didn't. No worries. You know, but but high school, you know, we had this, we had that band. But but in high school, what really uh, at Booker T. Washington Arts Magnet, all of our group of friends, were, we were called Munchers, Munch Puppies. Okay. And that kind of came from a friend of ours who was a cartoonist, made this cartoon and and called with a couple friends of ours and made characters of them called them Munchers, and so we were called Munchers and. Munching was a name of, it was a kind of jamming. You're munching, you're munching out. It's a yeah. way, and it's also, you know, we would get hungry for some reason, you know, after jamming. <laughs> of course. These things yeah. would make us hungry. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, high school stoners and we were the munchers. <laughs> and, uh, but Aaron Comus, a lot of really wicked musicians came out of Booker T at that time. And, you know, we How still will. that guy, Aaron Comus? He is uh, the drummer for the Spin Doctors. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All Legendary right. now. He lives here, doesn't he? Uh, no, he's he's still in New York. He's okay. been up in New York for the whole time, and they all met each other at the new school up there and have stayed friends and close up there. Okay. And uh, anyway, so the munchers, you know, that, that so the munch puppies would play, we would, we would play parties, and not a lot of times we wouldn't be asked. And you know, we have horn players that would play with us too. And if we heard there was a party, we would show up with instruments. And literally, Big Al would go set up his drums. I'd have guitar, bass, drums. And before the person who was having the party knew it, there was a band playing <laughs> in some room in their house. You know, we were asked to leave a couple times. We just loved doing that. Yeah. We'd just show up with our shit and just start playing. And uh, what were you doing? What kind of music were you doing? We it was it was ja it was Miles jazz jams mixed with Black Sabbath. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you a Sabbath guy? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, Deep Purple. I was. I'm. I mean, I'm a '70s hard rock dude. I loved Deep Purple. Loved Black Sabbath. Did you ever get into like the crazy guitar guys in the like the '80s, the Ingve world of Randy Rhodes or? Uh, when that started happening, that's when I was at Booker T. You know, I appreciated Randy Rhodes, and I, you know, having those roots, I still liked. I liked Riot. I didn't give a shit. You know, I like Rat and stuff. You know, so when that stuff would, just, that's what was going out. But I was already right. at Booker T. and playing other stuff that I was right, right. really into. But I appreciated that, so I had jumped ship into a different kind of player at that point. Although I appreciated it. Yeah, yeah. And you still listen to to the same music that you've listened to your whole life. How is it that that always happens to all of us? <laughs> I work new stuff in all the time, but like I don't like. It's hard not to listen to what you have always liked. That yeah, that's true. It, I it still comes up, but 
if you do that too much, you're going to, you know, find yourself the one day, what can I listen to? Nothing sounds interesting. And, you know, you got to work at it to make something interesting and something fresh for your ears. These days, what I'm really into was really old country. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And and the the songs and the stories of it and things like that. and Carter family kind of thing. I just watched that thing, so I feel like I'm a wild I did too. And that kind of refreshed (laughs) my whole interest in it. Well, my roots are Kentucky hillbilly. My, My... my uh, grandparents were from Kentucky Hillbillies, and my grandparents went on a you know horse-drawn wagon to Worcester, Ohio, where I was born. That's so so uh, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and I so I have actually bluegrass roots. Uh, my my great uncle Junior made made guitars and fiddles, and uh, it's something I'm, I plan on exploring. I'm going to try to get one of those instruments, and I'm going to really I'm I'm starting to get into these Kentucky roots and I've been really into bluegrass lately and uh I'm I'm going to take that on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what's funny about I've I've never really connected with it and I feel like there's whatever I've listened to lacks a dynamic that mm. I need. Yeah. And it seems like in your like all the music that I've heard that you've made does kind of have a dynamic where it gets quiet and it gets bigger, you know what I mean? Sure. Is yeah. That hard? I mean like do you well, know what am I wrong? No, I appreciate I I appreciate that and and you know what's funny is I hear the dynamic in country music more than I used to. Huh. I, I, you know, it's like, it's a different thing if you follow the story, there's the dynamic. Yeah. And and the music's way more subtle. It's way it's way more subtle. And I hear it more, you know, and it gets me. The, I mean, the tune I've heard a million times, Long Black Veil. Dude, that's a good song. Holy crap. I think I know what you're talking about. Am I uh, Lefty Frizzell. Okay, yeah. Long yeah, yeah. Black Veil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Really, really good. And if, and if you listen to the story and just, it starts to, it's a different dynamic, you know, and, you know, I, c- I can hear Edie's words in my ears like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been like that forever. Yeah. Thanks for finally coming around. But, I mean, but uh, you know, honestly, though, in our band, just immediately, okay, so here's what happened. New Bohemians were a band already, and, and Eric right. Presswood was the guitar player, right. and uh, Edie had joined the band, and and for whatever reason... There were two. There were the separation was happening, and Eric was a you know. The, anyway, I was I was going to maybe be the new guitar player, so I came over to jam one night, and you know I I was a fusion dude at that time. I liked Miles Davis and I liked Mahavish, Mahavishnu, and so I practiced John McLaughlin stuff all the time, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play like that. That's where my head was at. But I walked in the rehearsal space, and the first thing we play is an open A chord, and I, it was just one. Four, I don't know what it was, but something about playing with Edie like immediately made me. It's just songs. And I like, I don't know where it came from, but all, all I cared about was songs then. That's, I don't care if it's one, two chords. I don't care if it's one chord. I don't care what it is. It was just weird. It just kind of got stripped away. And there's, there's a song we have called Plain Jane. We wrote that the first day. It is the most easy one, four, five. It's the easiest of songs. Every song we wrote that day is completely easy. And uh, so just the band really changed everything. And I started to appreciate this song. And... Uh, Anyway, you, I think that's what really that. differentiates if you guys are playing like a jam festival or something like that. You can jam, but you also do have songs. There are some jam bands that lack the songs. That's what I'm... Which is that, a danger. That's what I'm, you know, there's no Edie on the jam scene. There's nobody no. who, 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 okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to riff this song. Yeah. Let alone the fact that she's a female. There's yeah, no yeah. person yeah. that does it. And there's definitely not a female. Bi- well, not definitely not. I mean, Tedeschi, Trucks. Right, I right. mean, she is really, really awesome. Yeah, yeah. I love her. But I mean, you know. They have songs it, too. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They really do. And that's a great example. And she probably has everything to do with that for sure. But I mean, there's, you know, th- who else? There's really not, you know, a big female on the jam scene. and No. I think I think it's there for the taking, and I think people will be blown away by her. A lot, of, you know, you know, it's we're kind of reintroducing ourselves. You know, we have no illusions. You know, we're from a long time ago. We jam. <laughs> That's what we do all the time. And now there's a whole industry set up for it. You know, but those people don't know us, so we're sort of reintroducing ourselves and coming in. And you know, it's it's interesting. How does it feel now to uh, to do this on your own terms, as opposed to like at the you know? When you first started making records, I know that you guys had a lot of people sitting on your heads, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And you get to make your decisions now. Yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, we're better at it. I yeah. think we could be trusted with the decisions a little more, you know? And, you know... We're the, also not 22. Not 22. <laughs> and, and, you know, and looking back at a lot of the stuff, 
we did know more than we thought we did back in those days. And, you know, to say no at those, if I'd have gone back, I'd have said no a couple more times. And I did, to tell you the truth. You start to realize, you know, age and, you know, yes, uh, a lot of uh, insight comes with experience, but also the flash of inspiration is truth, man. You know, at whatever age, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to keep you guys from your social media day. <laughs> social media. Yeah. That sounds awful. I hope nobody heard that. No, <laughs> I'm just that's, kidding. It's, you know what? No, in we some are. Ways, having... I was going to ask you, like, what is that? How does that feel at this point? But the other thing, too, is it is, is you're, you're in control of it. You're doing it. You wore the shirt you wanted to wear. You didn't have, they didn't send a lady to your hotel to. That only happened once. But you, so yeah. funny. No, but those things are, I mean, I've been through that. It's, it's yeah. not. It's not you. Yeah, yeah. And it feels weird. Yeah, it does. People try to, they go like, hey, we love you, but we want you to be this thing that we think is better. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, we didn't get a whole lot of that. No? Yeah, because we were the oddball. Okay. So we kind of got under the... They gave it to you. They were th- like, there, right, there were. I mean... They're hippies. Uh, yeah. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't mean, you know, we never watched the video for Hard Rain's Gonna Fall because... You know, that's not to say that there were people coming in that tried to make us something that like, whoa, what is that? That tended to happen in the videos. I'll be honest with you. That's a trippy video. I don't know if you've ever seen yeah, the har- Yeah. I watched it that night after I saw you play with Billy Gunn. Yeah, with the... Yeah, with the you all kind of like lit, black and white, soft kind of... Uh, well, and it, isn't like we're that. In, we're, a, yeah, well, we're in front of that. Oh, no, no. I'm thinking of Mama Help Me. Excuse me. Okay. Mama Help Me. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we're standing in front of the wall of people that are immersed into the wall. I don't, I don't <laughs> remember that video as much as I... I think I bought that album the day it came out. Right on. And I saw you guys at might have been on that it was on that tour right you guys played at Tower Theater in Houston yeah did you do that yeah that we tour? did that yeah my friend David Rice opened for you oh wow and I got to tag along with him nice to go to the show yeah very nice yeah very very yeah. cool um, Kenny this has been a pleasure oh hey, well, there's another yes, thing man. what else are you doing now is there anything that you're uh, out y- there well so teach? many things a lot of things dissolved when this came together that the school that I was working for at the time, they did have to close their doors for funding, but had a 10 year, you know, for public funding, they had a great 10 year run, but unfortunately they did close their doors. And a lot of things just kind of, uh, I was playing in a band called Forgotten Space and playing Grateful Dead music for about 11 years and Uh touring around quite a bit. And so I kind of stepped away from that at the same time. And uh, this all came, so I'm really kind of just doing this Right now. That's awesome. Yeah. And then uh, Nubo's uh, quartet, us guys. Are doing some uh, shows. Yeah. We are. We're going to, we're, we're uh, doing instrumental shows. There's a show coming up called the Days of uh, the Deadhead down here in Austin. Uh-huh. That's November 2nd. And we're, we're doing an instrumental show there. And, uh, but this band, I think is going to tour. And I think that'll be great for the jam scene because we're going to get in action and just jam instrumentally. And anyway, we're, we're setting the ground the groundwork for the jam scene with, yeah. with this band and then it'll filter over into Nubos into ED, EBNB so yeah okay. yeah, a lot of different uh, incarnations yeah yeah we got the two but yeah. I, I mean we're known as Edie Burkell and New Bohemian so to everybody but people in Dallas we're like well we should just you know because Edie can't work all the time we're yeah. just gonna we're gonna work yeah yeah yeah. well Kenny man it's been great hey man I appreciate thank you, you very so very much, much. Hey, very thank great you. talking to you great talking to you thank you Kenny Withrow of Edie Burkell and New Bohemians. You can find them at ebnewbows.com. And uh, actually, you can see New Bohemians doing their instrumental music at Day of the Deadhead, Saturday, November 2nd, here in Austin, Texas. Go to, uh, I'll put a link to this on our Facebook page, the link to the event. I found it on, uh, on Facebook. Anyway, what a great conversation, man. What a great guy. It was fantastic. It was great getting to, uh, to hang out and see that thing that they were filming and like the set that they had built. It was real cool. Uh, I guess follow them on social media and you'll get to see some of that stuff. Great talking to Kenny Withrow. I want to thank him for taking the time to sit down and talk to me over there at Soundcheck. That's where we did this, all right? And hey, listen, if, you, if you're just coming to the show for the first time, we're available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you find podcasts. You get a new show every Tuesday and every Friday, and every once in a while, like today, a surprise Thursday show. All right? Thank you so much for listening. I'm Johnny. I'm the host. Let's get back to some uh, Edie Raquel New Bohemians music. All right? Thank you to Kenny Withrow for talking to me. Let's get down.
Sky.